Thank you for joining our Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Updates in Gastric Cancer and is the ninth in a series of 12 monthly webinars. I am Mary Margaret Kilmeyer and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm the Programs Director for Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer and a licensed marriage and family therapist. My clinical and research background is focused on working collaboratively with doctors, patients, their families, and the members of their healthcare teams. We would like to thank our title sponsors, Boston Biomedical and EMD Serono, as well as our platinum sponsor, Lilly Oncology, for providing the funding to make this webinar possible. You will be able to ask questions during this presentation. You can type your question into the white text box that appears on your screen. And we will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation if time allows. In addition, we will be recording this webinar, and the recording will be accessible on our website in the lecture library. First, I will share information with you about our president and founder, Debbie Zellman, and Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. Then we will hear a presentation on updates in gastric cancer from Dr. Arun Nagarajan of the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Then the presentation will be followed by the question and answer session before conclusion. Pictured here is the president and founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. A practicing attorney and a mother of three, she had no risk factors for stomach cancer. And at the time, her symptoms were very vague. She was told that her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. Since that time, she's endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and has experienced many recurrences over nine years and is still a patient to this day. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009, just one year after her diagnosis. As an organization, we're a member of several advocacy coalitions, including the Deadliest Cancer Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. Debbie also serves as a patient advocate on numerous committees and task forces. Many of you may be familiar with the facts and statistics about stomach cancer, and we work to continually be updated on them as well. In 2017, it's estimated that more than 28,000 Americans will be diagnosed with stomach cancer, and more than 11,000 will die from this disease. 80% of all patients are diagnosed at stage four when the five-year survival rate is only four to 5%, and the incidence rates in younger populations has increased while the expected frequency has been on the decline. And yet, very few people know much about this deadly disease. Debbie Stream Foundation is dedicated to raising awareness about stomach cancer, advancing funding for research, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more about our mission and organization by visiting our website at www.wstream.org. In a few short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 25 chapters across the United States, as well as chapters in Canada and in Germany. And there are events ongoing around the country. Our patient resource education program helps patients, their families, and caregivers around the world by matching them with survivors and caregivers using disease-specific criteria, including stage, biomarker, and their location and demographic information. We host educational webinars, such as the one you're listening to today, and symposia year-round. And our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer that can be translated into more than 60 languages. We've provided $650,000 in direct research grants, as well as advocating during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. And this has resulted in nearly $12 million being awarded to stomach cancer researchers. This is a quick snapshot of our website's homepage, and you can see across the top that there are numerous links that you can find that will lead you to resources, including our online stomach cancer support community, Stomach Cancer 101, lecture library, and more. And here are some of the many events that are coming up on the horizon. There are golf tournaments in November in North Carolina and in Florida. In addition, all of the month of November is dedicated to Curing Stomach Cancer Month. 
please see our advocacy page on our website for more information about this, this month and instructions on how to declare Caring Stomach Cancer Month in your state. On November 4th, we're also going to be hosting the Dallas Stomach Cancer Education Symposium and Webinar. This is an incredibly informative and educational event that is free for everyone to attend, either in person if you're in the Dallas area, or you can also log in to a webcasted version. It's also great to know that we will be live translating that event into Spanish for participants who are in person in our audience, as well as participants who'd like to join that webcast around the world. For more information about any of these and our other events, please go to our website and click on the Events tab. DDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on this slide, you can see several important phone numbers and the email addresses that you can use to contact our office and our staff for support and assistance. We'll now begin the presentation made possible in part by our title sponsors, Boston Biomedical and EMD Serono. The topic this month is updates in gastric cancer. And our speaker is Dr. Arun Nagarajan of Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Dr. Nagarajan's primary clinical interest is caring for patients with gastrointestinal malignancies. His research focuses on clinical trials of new treatment options for these patients. He's a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the American Society of Hematology, and we thank him for joining us today. And now, Dr. Nagarajan, I will turn the webinar over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to give a brief update on the gastric cancer for the year of the 2017. Uh, I, I want to start off by giving some background information of the tumor, then I would like to talk about where we are as of now. Um, I want to allude to the stages of treatment for early disease. I'll show you, uh, I'll show that we kind of still do gastrectomy. And for uh, locally advanced, the options are chemo radiation therapy or chemo and then the adjuvant therapy. So let's start off by talking a few slides about the incidence and, and the distribution of the tumor worldwide. Um, so it's still one of the most common cancers worldwide. Uh, about 22,000 patients are diagnosed annually and uh, up to 10,000 patients are expected to die. But the good news is the incidence of the tumor has declined over the last few decades, probably because of better H. pylori detection. And also the hypothesis is uh, the better use of refrigerators in third world countries has decreased the use of salt-based uh, food uh, preparation. So, so that may be one of the factors for decline in the incidence of gastric cancer. In this picture, you can see, I can use my mouse, you know, I guess. I can use the mouse here. So um, in this picture, you can see that uh, red distributes um, is, is an indication that there is significant tumor in the Far East, especially Japan, Taiwan, and China, and also increased incidence in South America. Uh, there is increased incidence in Venezuela and Chile. Um, the factors are not clearly uh, are not very clear, but um, the hypothesis is there is a lot of salt preparation in fish and meat, and in South America it could be more H. pylori. Uh, next slide, please. One of the problems and challenges with gastric cancer is most patients are diagnosed in an advanced stage, and by the time you diagnose, 50% of them have disease beyond the stomach. So, and the other issue is screening is not widely performed. Um, it's offered in places like Japan, Venezuela, and Chile. And uh, when you look at the screening in those countries, they can they, they often subject patients to upper endoscopy or sometimes they do a barium uh, enterography. So those are the approved uh, screening modalities in those areas, but not in the US. When I was a medical student, I remember uh, looking at the three A's of gastric cancer. Um, that could be anorexia, asthenia, and anemia. That's the diagnostic symptoms. Anorexia means you don't feel like eating. Asthenia means significant fatigue and weakness. And anemia, obviously, the tumor can bleed and cause anemia. Uh, next slide, please. So the two uh, main types of uh, gastric cancer is intestinal type and diffuse type. 
intestinal type is seen in 70 to 80 percent of the cases it uh, it is seen in all these endemic areas in in the far east and south america and um, this is thought to be triggered because of something in the environment um, you know let's talk a, briefly about the environmental factors for this type of cancer uh, as i said h pylori is, is a source then smoked smoked fish and salt salty foods um, and also nitroso compound in cheese and meat could be a factor. So it's something to bear in mind as we, as we think about the etiologies for these tumors. So there's a male to female, two to one. And, and moving on to the diffuse type, which is 20 to 30 percent, it is uniform across countries. And it's younger, um, it's seen in younger patients, and it could be hereditary. There's a CDH1 gene, um, which is uh, which has been implicated, caused genetic type of gastric cancer. But by and large, what we see in our clinics is the intestinal type. Next slide, please. So um, most patients with local regional disease, that means stage one to three, um, they have to go through preoperative testing and they're all potentially curable. You know, the cure is still in the 25 to 30 percent, um, but still when you see a patient with stomach cancers, you have to put them through all those tests to um, deem the stage of the disease. And when you have a, a gastric cancer that is T2, I mean, the depth of the tumor when it's T2 or higher, you'll have to subject them to multidisciplinary team to see what is the best strategy for that disease. And for stage 4 disease, uh, we offer them palliative chemotherapy or best supportive care, depending on their functional status. Uh, in terms of preoperative testing, obviously, to make a diagnosis, you need an upper endoscopy, sometimes an endoscopic ultrasound. Um, we order CT scans and, and sometimes PET scan. Recently, I had a patient uh, who just had a CT scan. Uh, we ended up getting a PET scan because he was having some leg pain. And unfortunately, the lesion lit up in the femur in the hip bone and biopsy confirmed that it was metastatic. So PET can show up uh, on gastric. The other problem is even in early stage of this cancer, when you do a laparoscopic look, about 20 to 30% of these patients have abdominal disease, uh, meaning stage four disease, and they have a negative CT scan. So I have used laparoscopy in certain cases to make sure there's no mm, underlying stage four disease. Next slide, please. Dr. Nagarajan, actually, I was wondering, because we've had some other speakers discuss the difference in the need for that laparoscopic staging. Right, right. Could you explain why it's so difficult right. for the intestinal disease and, and some of the tumor to show up at the metastatic locations? Right, that's a great question. You know, I think the gastric cancers are not very pet avid. When you do a PET scan, um, you know, the FDG dye should show up in the cancer cells. It depends on the replication of the cancer cell, the cycling, and um, and depends on the biology of the tumor. They don't light up sometimes on PET. And, um, and especially when you do a CT scan of the abdomen, and the peritoneal cancers can hide between the colon, and, you know, the small nodules may not show up on the CT scan. So uh, this is one of the big dilemmas in gastric cancer where uh, even I've had patients who I know have progressed to stage 4 disease, you know, but it doesn't show up on CT scan. So recently I had a guy who came for a second opinion who had stomach cancer and, and bulky lymph nodes in the stomach area. So we, we had to call him three to the stage 3 and give him chemo radiation. But I ended up getting a laparoscopy to see, and then he had a nodule right next to the liver, the falciform, falciform ligament. So that called them, that made him stage four disease, you know. So it's one of, like lung cancer is a very hot tumor. When you do a PET scan, it lights up. It's easy to document the burden of the disease, but not the same for gastric cancer. I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Right. Next slide. So this is the algorithm of how we approach gastric cancer in the U.S. today. On the left hand, if it's early disease, if you can move the mouse on the left hand for early early disease, you know, stage T1, N0, 
Um, so in this early stage, you know, stage 1A, stage 1B, if it's a very incidentally found early disease, T1, you can you can do observation or, or even surgery. I mean, obviously, you do a gastrectomy. And if it's a T1, you just observe. Um, but if it's um, T2 and beyond, you really need them to present the case at a multidisciplinary tumor board. We have a tumor board here. We have an upper GI tumor board. We meet every Tuesday, every other Tuesday. Uh, and then we like to figure out what is the best uh, step for this patient. Um, the national trend is to give some sort of neoadjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant means treatment before surgery. In the U.S., we still do chemoradiation therapy. That's based on the CROSS trial, which I will show. In in Europe, in England, I mean, in Germany, they tend to do more chemotherapy uh, and less chemoradiation therapy, followed by gastrectomy and then some more adjuvant chemotherapy. And obviously, on the right-hand side, if there is stage 4 disease, we talk about systemic chemotherapy options. And sometimes we do palliative radiation therapy for the tumor area, uh, if it's bleeding or if it's obstructed and so on. Next slide, please. I'm going to elaborate on this on 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 this algorithm and explain how we got to this uh, uh, information and 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 uh, recommendations. So the first game changer was in 2001. This intergroup 0116 study. This has been quoted in many other textbooks. It's called the famous McDonald trial. In this, um, patients with stage one to stage uh, four, um, early stage four resected gastric cancers. But in this, the resection was not, um, the lymph node resection was less than adequate. The D1 resection was 36%. That means local lymph node resection was only 36%, but the uh, distant resection was only 10%. And then they were randomized to either just watching or chemo plus radiation therapy. The 5-FU was the old archaic chemo. Um, the, and this regimen was pretty complicated. You had to give some chemotherapy first and then chemoradiation and then some more chemotherapy. But did, this study did show a survival benefit of 36 over 27 months. And the group that got post-surgery chemoradiation lived for 36 months as opposed to 27 months on the observational arm. Next slide, please. And this is the same slide, T1 through T4, N0 to N1. And uh, one of the big criticisms of the study was that the surgery was the lymph node dissection was not optimal in this. Uh, majority of the patients only had D1 resection, which means just uh, local resection, not, not the ex extensive uh, lymph node resection. Uh, so as I said, the observation arm was inferior to the adjuvant chemoradiation therapy arm. Next slide, please. Actually, I'm sorry, if, if we could elaborate just briefly on that. This is a question that I do hear often from patients right. who contact us is regarding the decision about lymph node resection right. um, in terms of how, how do surgeons and the team decide where to, di to dissect right. and how many lymph nodes to study. Right. So that is the big concern, you know. So gastric uh, resections have to be done by specialized surgeons, surgeons who have high volume and who do this day in, day out. You know, you can Google the D1 and D2 resections, you know. Um, I think the Japanese are the best at this. When you go to these meetings, they show amazing resections. You know, they go all the way along the hepatic artery. They do much more um, aggressive resections. But I think in the U.S., in my in my experience, um, the surgery with the optimal lymph node debulking is still a question mark. It's not as good as the as the Japanese counterparts, I think. Thank you. Yeah. So who benefits from adjuvant radiation therapy, um, intestinal type, or if there's an incomplete nodal dissection, or if there's a positive node? then we could consider adjuvant radiation therapy. But, you know, doing radiation therapy post-gastric resection is going to be a challenge and, and a difficult process because of the changes in the anatomy, you know, the, the Ivor Lewis pull-through surgery is a messy one. Next slide, please. Um, 
so the japanese approach is very different you know uh, even the biology of the stomach cancers are felt that the uh, the far east has a different biology than the western gastric cancers um, even molecularly it, there seems to be a difference between the two so in japan when patients who have gastric um, surgery gastrectomy they get randomized to in this study they got randomized to observation versus adjuvant s1 s1 is an oral form of 5fu it's not approved in the us yet but it's used in japan i thought this was an interesting slide because this showed a survival benefit uh 3 year survival for the adjuvant s1 was 81% versus 70% so hopefully you know we can do these trials here and and get it approved but um i haven't heard anything yet uh in terms of approval it's not approved in the us yet next slide please so moving on in in europe especially in england where this study was done uh, um, this was the pre operative chemotherapy so you know in europe they don't believe in chemo radiation uh, for stomach cancer they feel like the disease fails beyond the stomach it's not just local control it tends to metastasize to the peritoneum tends to metastasize to the liver so that's where preoperative chemotherapy um comes into play in this study they gave preoperative ec ecx um, ecf x or zolota epirubicin cisplatin and zolota or 5fu for for three cycles that's three months and then you do surgical resection and then you do three more cycles of of the same regimen um and this showed a survival benefit the median overall survival was better 24 versus uh, the five year survival was 36 versus 23% and the hazard ratio was 0.75 so when you look at the nccn guidelines this is one of the approved forms of preoperative new adjuvant therapy which is chemotherapy next slide please um going back to the magic trial you know one of the problems with the magic trial is when patients get preoperative chemo and then surgery only 30 to 40% of those patients can actually have post op chemo because they are so beat up after surgery so then there, there comes this cross trial this is a dutch study um where they they gave preoperative chemo radiation for t2 to t3 and n0 n1 what's interesting in this is then this they had g junction or gastric cancer but one of the criticisms in this study was the gastric component uh, in this study was only 15 to 20% about 20% of the patient represented gastric but majority of them were g junction next slide please So when you look at the median overall survival in this the group that got chemo radiation in this chemo was carboplatin taxol plus radiation you get five weekly uh, chemotherapy doses plus radiation and then followed by surgery the median overall survival was double was 49 versus 26 months so in the US i think most physicians prefer the cross study approach they tend to do chemo radiation uh followed by surgery you know the universal embracement of um chemotherapy without radiation is uh, has not been the case i have done both i've done the magic trial the ecf versus cross i know i you know it's difficult the the chemotherapy arms are difficult it's a lot easier to do the chemo radiation next slide so that concludes that part of the presentation which is algorithm you know as i showed the algorithm this is how we do what we do um in a new adjuvant setting you have the option of chemotherapy or chemo radiation if you do new adjuvant chemo you have to follow that up with more adjuvant chemo post op next slide so now i want to move on to the next piece of the talk which is all the updates from this year's asco meeting um this was the uh, german study group uh, which showed um they challenged the existing ecf the magic trial they challenged magic trial and said well can we do any better so they gave flot flot is basically taxotere 5fu lucovorin and oxaliplatin similar to similar to folfox uh, but with an addition of uh, an additional drug called taxotere uh, 
um, and then um, they randomized to another group called uh, ECF. Um, so next slide, please. So they showed that the five-year survival rate for the flot was was better than ECF, 45 versus 36. Um, uh, it was actually 45 versus 36 months. Next slide, please. And the hazard ratio was 0.77. Also, there was superiority in uh, progression-free survival. The five-year survival was 41 months versus 31 months. Next slide. But the key things to take home was the toxicity of flot was much higher. Um, there was more vomiting, which was the p-value was significant in the ECF regimen. And the infection risk was higher in the flawed regimen with a, with a significant p-value. But the risk of neutropenia seemed to be a little higher in the flawed regimen, but it was not uh, significant in terms of p-value. The, you know, one thing to note is there were toxic deaths, you know, in both. You know, there were two deaths in ECF and two deaths in flawed. <laughs> Whenever we see patients in our clinic, even be it colon cancer, sometimes, you know, patients die even in an adjuvant setting. So these these regimens are not completely foolproof, you know. There's this toxic element to it. Next slide. I mean, next slide, please. Actually, I was wondering if you could explain for our listeners what a p-value is and how that informs the statistical significance. Right. So p-value is called significant if it's less than 0.005. So when it's 0.002, meaning the chance of it being a real difference is it's not known. It, it boils down to number of events. So the more the events, it gives you the uh, significant p-value. So it's, its significance is when, it, when it's less than 0 0.005. Next slide. So, in conclusion, in this study, in comparison of ECF to ECX, flawed was superior, um, but there is um, morbidity associated with it. Um, so, in Germany, I think uh, this Albertran, who who gave the presentation, that's their new standard of care. Instead of ECX or ECF, they they prefer flawed in Germany. Next slide. So this was an interesting abstract, I thought. Um, they compared, uh, you know, the standard uh, expertly laparotomy and open esophagectomy for gastric cancer, which is the Ivor Lewis procedure, which was compared to the hybrid minimally invasive, the small laparoscopic and, and the incision. Um, next slide. It showed that, um, that the hybrid uh, was slightly superior um, then the standard uh, open surgery. Next slide. I think the key was the major pulmonary complications were, were significantly lower in the hybrid surgery, 17 versus 30 percent, and the anastomotic leakage uh, rates were all similar. Um, what's also interesting is the median length of hospital day was also similar was 14 to 14. So in conclusion, they said that the hybrid procedure is a sound procedure and reduces the incidence of major morbidity, especially pulmonary. Um, and um, this also suggests that improvements in surgery might improve the prognosis of patients with esophageal cancer. So this is an interesting abstract. Next slide, please. So, you know, I just want to also add a flavor from Japan um, where they still are doing the uh, S1 studies. Um, in this uh, post-surgery, um, they challenged their standard of care, which is six months of S1, which is an oral drug. It's an oral 5-FU. They compared it to one year of the oral uh, S1 drug. Next slide. And showed that the overall survival um, was was improved so they concluded that in patients with stage 2 gastric cancer it is possible to continue the s1 for up to one year without any significant toxicity next slide but as i said it's not approved in the us it's done in in japan so this was another interesting abstract for stage 4 gastric cancer you know, up to about 10 to 15 percent of the stomach cancers can express HER2. So we use drugs like trastuzumab and pertuzumumab. Right now, in patients with metastatic um, gastric cancer who express HER2, the standard of care is um, platinum plus 5-FU or Zolorda, and we add trastuzumab to that. 
in this study, they added pertuzumumab to the trastuzumumab, uh, similar to what we do in breast cancer. Next slide. All right, so in this, uh, in the, when they added this additional drug, really there was no additional benefit. The median survival was still the same. It was um, the median months of survival was 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 the same? Next slide, please. So what they concluded was uh, that the study did not meet the primary endpoint of overall survival. Um, so it's not recommended to add the additional pertuzumab right now. So if you have a HER2 positive cancer, what we do in our clinics we, is we just add trastuzumab to the standard chemotherapy backbone. Next slide, please. So we, uh, when we go to the ECOG meetings, I was hearing about this RAD001. It's an mTOR inhibitor. And they wanted to see uh, if it was effective in this uh, heavily treated subpopulation. So in this study, you know, in inoperable metastatic gastric or G-junction adenocarcinoma who have had at least one to three prior lines with an ECOG score of, you know, who had a reasonable performance status, they got placebo plus taxol or this RAD001 plus taxol. Next slide, please. And uh, it was uh, the study did not show any survival improvement or progression-free survival. Next slide. And uh, it was toxic. So um, compared with Taxol alone, RAD001 did not improve outcome. So the so this was a negative trial. Next slide, please. So this leads us into this era of immunotherapy. So how did we get here? There were a lot of phase one and phase two studies with nivolumab and uh, pembrolizumab. So I just wanted to present this phase three study. Uh, it's called the Attraction 02. In this uh, metastatic patients who've had at least greater than or equal to two lines of therapy with good performance status. Uh, they enrolled these patients in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan and they randomized them to nivolumab or placebo. Next slide, please. Next slide. And it showed that there was a survival difference, you know, 27% versus 12%. Next slide. So what's interesting here is when you look at the rates of uh, overall response in the placebo, as you would expect, the response rates were 0%. And in the overall response rate for the nivolumab was, was 31%, so with a significant p-value. So what they concluded was um, it worked in, uh, it, it showed an improvement compared to placebo regardless of the pdl one expression. Next slide. But that was limited to the Asian population. So then, um, then, they, then the next question was, what about the addition of nivolumab? So this was in the Western population, um, 160 patients. It was a three-arm study. The top group just got nivolumab. The next group got nivolumab at one milligram per kilogram plus epilumumab, which is what we do in other cancers like melanoma. And the third group got nivolumab plus epilumumab. Next slide, please. So in this slide, it's hard to understand, but they it, they showed response to all three lines, all three groups. Next slide. So this is a waterfall plot which shows response to to all three uh, groups. Next slide. So the rates of toxicity was was similar across the board. Um, you know, nothing that stands out in terms of toxicity. I think the rash was a little more when you got the nivolumab plus epilumumab, and the diarrhea was also higher uh, when, when, when the combination of EP plus nivolumab was administered. Next slide. So in conclusion, in patients who were heavily pretreated, um, the combination of nivolumab plus epilumab is active. Nivolumab alone is active, and it was active regardless of the PDL1 status. Next slide. So this is an interesting study which led to the approval of pembrolizumab. It's called the Keynote 059. Um, three cohorts. In the first uh, group, uh, they got pembrolizumab alone. In this, this are all patients who have refractory or metastatic G junction or gastric cancer. In the first cohort, it was pembrolizumab alone, 200 milligram every three weeks as monotherapy. 
The second group, it was pembrolizumab at 200 milligram plus chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy was cisplatin plus 5-FU and 5-FU or Zoloda. And in the third group was pembrolizumab alone, but um, um, it was 200 milligram uh, every three weeks. But in, this was only PDL1 positive. In the first, uh, in the first uh, group, it was PDL1 positive or negative. That was the key. Uh, next slide. So the overall response rates um, um, for all comers was 12%, but for PDL1 it was higher was 16%. For PDL1 negative it was only 6% in the in the first cohort, and in the second group overall response rates was higher was about 60%. And again, the rates of response was higher if, you, if they were PDL1 positive. And in the third group, the overall response rate was about 26%. And as I said, they were all PDL1 positive. Next slide. And the rates of side effects in the cohort number one uh, anemia was an issue, fatigue, um, dehydration. Uh, in the cohort two, there were more neutropenia and stomatitis because of the additional chemotherapy. Um, but um, in the toxic deaths um, in cohort, uh, in the last cohort, there was one death, no deaths in the chemotherapy arm, and two deaths in the first group. So what they concluded was, um, in conclusion, patients with advanced gastric cancer, um, there is activity from pembrolizumab. It is active when it's given in second, I mean, after two lines of therapy as monotherapy. Um, uh, it's also effective when it's given in combination with chemotherapy. It's also effective when it's just given by itself in PDL1 positive patients. And what they noted was the response rates were higher in patients who, uh, who were PDL1 positive. Uh, next slide. So this led to the first immunotherapy approval in the, in the USA. It was approved a few weeks ago. It was uh, on 9-22 of this year. Um, I just saw a patient today, and he met the, he met the criteria. So the approval is limited to patients who have, who've had at least two previous lines of chemotherapy, and they had to have PDL expression greater than or equal to one. So the approval was based on this Keynote 059 study. So pembrolizumab is approved. And uh, pretty soon, nivolumab may also be approved. Uh, there's some exciting phase three data. So we may have two drugs, uh, immunotherapy drugs soon. For now, pembrolizumab is the only immunotherapy approved uh, drug for gastric cancer or G-junction cancer. Next slide. So that leads us to the clinical trial that we have here at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm, I'm the primary investigator for this study. It's the HALO gastric lung 101 phase 1B clinical trial. One of the problems with gastric cancer is it creates a mesh around itself. It doesn't let chemotherapy and immunotherapy penetrate through that. Uh, we are giving this enzyme breaker hyaluronidase in addition to the immunotherapy to see if it will enhance the activity of immunotherapy. So the study requires that we only test uh, HA expression, that's hyaluronid as expression on the tumor. If they express HA and if they have progressed on one line measurable disease, they will be eligible for this study. But now with the new data, uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to have to check PDL1 also. So um, I will check PDL1 and HA expression both. And if they both are met, then I will offer them the clinical trial. Um, so there's ongoing accrual of the study here. So that concludes my talk, I think. That was the last slide. So I'm open for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Nagarajan, for all of this information and providing an overview of some of the most recent updates. As I know, people are always very interested in um, understanding that. So we will start to go through some of the questions that were submitted during your presentation. Mm -hmm. and First one to come up is that I've often heard that stomach cancer appears differently in different countries, either in biology yes. or by its location. Yes. Do we know what the cause of this is and how that might impact the response rates? 
That's true. In Japan, you know, uh, when you get adenomas, growths in the stomach, sometimes they watch it. And here in the U.S., they get resected. So there's a difference in biology. That's why, you know, when you go to the meetings, when they present data from Japan and Taiwan and China, they say it needs to be validated in the Western world. I think it's a different disease. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And I know... Yeah. Some of the studies you mentioned were, re were reports from other countries. Um, right. That enhances the importance of bringing new. And that's one of the reasons. And, and that's one of the reasons why the ASCO GI meeting is held in San Francisco every year, year after year, because you get a huge delegates from delegation from Japan and China, and so it's easier for them to come and present in the U.S. on the West Coast. So I think that's why it's it's always held in San Francisco. Oh, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, the next question is regarding the nivolumumab uh, data that you presented. Do yeah. you see a response to nevo in patients that are PDL1 negative? Right. So we'll have to see what the data is. Um, I think we got to be careful in this. You know, there may, I don't know if there's a difference. Both Pembro and Nevo work pretty similarly, the same targets. Um, so Pembro is approved only for the PDL1 positive patients. So we'll have to see. You know, we have to be careful in jumping and making our own conclusion because, as you know, the response rates are still pretty small. So we have to choose patients uh, wisely. In my opinion, I think looking back at it, I think we have to exhaust all chemotherapy options before we go to the immunotherapy because we know chemo works. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Earlier, you were talking about the um, PET scans in right. the presentation, and one question came in if there were any identified targets like the HER2 or PDL1, CDK, CDK4s that may have some uptake that could eventually help with PET diagnosis. Not really. You know, we ha I haven't seen any such um, differentiation points. You know, um, in my fellowship, we were taught that um, gastric cancers are not very pet avid, you know, and uh, even when I practice all these years, and I think that's true, not all gastric cancers light up on pet. We have had many patients who've had stage four disease, bulky disease. When you do a pet, it only lights up very faintly. So the question was, uh, does HER2 or PDL one have any impact on the FTG uptake? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, another question, what was the percentages of the patients um, to do chemotherapy after surgery in the miracle trial? In the, in the magic trial. In the magic. In the, I'm sorry. Yes, the magic trial. Yeah, it's pretty low. It's only 30-some percent, I think. Only one-third of the patients. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, also, again, another question regarding um the variation by countries. Mm. Uh, you also mentioned that endoscopy is done more commonly in other mm. countries as part of right. the diagnostic procedure. Could you talk a little uh, bit more about that and maybe why it's not done often here? As a screening, you know, it's all about when you want a tool as a screening tool to be effective, it depends on the number of incidents. You know, when you look at mammogram, for example, in breast cancer, I think mammogram saves lives, but when you look at the whole pool, how many uh, how many incidences like for example how many screening should you do to pick up one real patient that you could save not just die not just diagnose and 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 cure but but have you made a um, change in their in their outcome so to show that the incidence has to be high incidence of the cancer uh, so the incidence of cancer is very high in Japan and Chile and Venezuela. So it makes sense to employ screening in those areas and not for the grand population in the U.S. You know, like if you end up doing EGDs in the U.S. for all comers to screen for gastric cancer, you would have wasted a lot of resources. That is a very good point. Um, yeah. Aside from genetic factors like CDH1, uh, mm -hmm. are there any other high-risk populations that may have more access to that screening measure? Um, 
I, you know, I mean, I think if you have a family member with gastric cancer, you probably need to see a genetic counselor and go through the testing to see if there's any additional, um, you know, genetic um, syndromes that are underlying, and then maybe we can streamline. Um, obviously, you know, there are all these intestinal metaplasias. If you do uh, somebody, if you do an endoscopy on a patient, if you show some precursor changes in the stomach, obviously those patients need to be followed uh, more closely. But there's really no screening test unless you do the genetic test and see, and see if it's, it runs in family members. And um, speaking of metaplasia, uh, mm. I know that an H. pylori infection may uh-huh. ultimately lead to the metaplasia underlying. Right. Um, could you speak a little bit about the frequency um, when there is an H. pylori infection? How often does that lead to a stomach cancer diagnosis and right. the outcome? So- Right. That's a better question for a gastroenterologist. We are on the other end of the spectrum. You know, we, we a patient comes to come to see us when they've already had an established diagnosis. So I don't have a good handle on those numbers on, on what the H. pylori and how much of that causes metaplasia. So that's more of a gastroenterology question, I think. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time for the questions, for more questions for today. But I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Nagarajan, for joining us and sharing your expertise and uh, presenting this data to us. I know it has been really informative and helpful. All right. Thank you. And as you know, the, this webinar was brought to you by Debbie's Dream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer. And as I mentioned, the recorded version of this webinar and all of our past webinars can be found in the lecture library section of our website. I would, again, like to thank our sponsors who helped make this webinar possible, our title sponsors, Boston Biomedical and EMD Serono, as well as our platinum sponsor, Lily Oncology. As a reminder, please check our website and your calendars and join us at an event near you. Thank you to Dr. Nagarajan and all of our listeners today. This concludes the ninth in a series of 12 webinars. Our next webinar will be November 17th at 12 noon Eastern time on the topics of hospice care and end-of-life planning. To view recorded webinars, please visit our lecture library, and we would love to hear any feedback and questions or thoughts that you might have before November 17th. Please send your comments to patient.resource at debbystream.org. Thank you for joining us.